I welcome everyone to the 2021 Burbage Lecture and the results of the New Zealand Astrophotography Competition. Uh, those who are new may not be aware that the Burbage Lecture is normally given at the Burbage Annual... Yeah, sorry about that. I was just having a slight sound problem here. The, um, yeah, okay, thanks, Steve. Sorry about that. Just had a bit of a uh, feedback coming through. The, um, tonight, um, we're going to um, start with the Burbage Lecture, which will be presented by Dr. Hannah Wakeford. And the talk will be on diving through exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, quite an incredible um, thing that we're able to determine information about planets that are orbiting stars outside the solar system. Dr. Waitford is a uh, lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Bristol, where she leads a group researching atmospheres of exoplanets using observations from space telescopes. And um, I'm really uh, pleased to have Hannah available to do this talk for us online from the UK, especially at this time of the morning in the UK, just after 7am. She was recommended to us by Professor Chris Lintot, who many of you will know as one of the presenters of the BBC Sky at Night program. So um, at the end of Hannah's talk, um, I'll field any questions that are put on the YouTube chat. And um, after that, Andrew Buckingham will be presenting the results of the astrophotography competition. So without further ado, um, over to Hannah. Thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be talking to people across the other side of the world. And I hope that uh, you can learn things from what I'm about to talk about and also uh, find just some curiosity in there as well to, to go and look out at the sky, as all of you uh, already do as part of the society. And as you'll see later, some amazing images in the astronomy competition. So without further ado, I'll just jump right into this. And we've already had an introduction of an exoplanet, a planet that is outside of our solar system orbiting another star in the sky. But I want to start somewhere a little bit more familiar. I want to start inside our solar system with the array of planets that we have orbiting around this one star, the sun. We have eight planets, many moons, many dwarf planets, asteroids, comets, all orbiting around this one star. And they're all incredibly diverse. They're all incredibly different planets. If we look at their atmospheres, we see this huge array of different contents, different things that make up their atmosphere. And the big question we have when we're going to these exoplanets, when we're trying to study, we're trying to discover them, is, is how similar are they to our solar system? And what are they like? What is the nature of these worlds? How do they live in their environments and interact in their environments? And what can we learn about them? So I'm going to show you the scale of our solar system. And I love this image because it really does put into stark contrast just the sheer size of not only the sun, but of the gas giants. So we've got our Jupiter, Saturn gas giants, and then our ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And you can see how tiny we are. You can just see how small we are and the prominence of our moon as well. So this is just a really nice way of thinking about these other planetary systems in terms of their scale. What kinds of scales are we going to be looking at? That's the first question we have. How big are these planets going to be? But I'm interested in their atmospheres. I study their atmospheres. I want to know what they're like. I want to know what this world is. So one thing that really helped me get there was when I was doing my master's, I studied the solar atmosphere and the interaction with the Earth's atmosphere. And I was lucky enough to do that up in the Arctic in Svalbard and Norwegian island in the Arctic. And if some of you were lucky over the last few days, you might have seen the Aurora Australis 
that was uh, shining in the sky due to a recent CME event, a coronal mass ejection, plasma being fired off of the sun directly towards the earth. It took a few days for that plasma to reach us. But even that short time scale suggests it was traveling at thousands, thousands of kilometers an hour. So this is showing you that actually our planet sits inside two atmospheres, the Earth's atmosphere and the sun's atmosphere. And what you're seeing with the aurora is the interaction of those two atmospheres coming together, connecting magnetically through our Earth's beautiful magnetic field, which channels it down towards the poles. And we see something very, very similar with the atmosphere of Jupiter, which also has aurora and also has interactions with its moons and imprinting that on the aurora. But we are actually a solar system that sits within two atmospheres. The star is hugely important. But as I said before, we have a load of different planets. We've got a really diverse set of planets in our solar system, and they've all made up of, of various different things. We've got some commonalities, though. So I'm going to ignore Mercury for now because its atmosphere is a trillion times thinner than the Earth, so it's it's not really an atmosphere. But if we look at Venus and Mars, you can see those two are CO2 based. So their dominant material in their atmosphere, if we were to measure their atmosphere, the dominant material would be CO2. For the Earth, it's nitrogen, which actually when you measure it, you wouldn't be able to see. So it doesn't have very strong spectral signatures. So it would be the O2 and the argon, which also doesn't have anything. So we're really focused on the smaller amount in the atmosphere. For our Jupiters and our Saturns, Uranus and Neptunes, you can see they're dominated by that hydrogen and helium mix. But it's to various degrees and it's these other gases which are the hugely important thing here. These are gas giants. We know they're gas giants. Their density helps tell us that they're gas giants. But it's these other materials in there that change what it is that we're seeing. And it's the difference between this 2.5% and this 1% which completely changes the colour of the atmosphere for Uranus and Neptune. So small changes in things in the atmosphere have a huge effect. And we're going to see how that imprints on exoplanets as well later on in the talk. But I want to take you through some of the stunning things in our solar system, some of my favourite things, and just looking at these atmospheres and how they change with time. The first thing I wanted to kind of highlight is just these amazing new images that we have of Venus's atmosphere. Venus has a incredibly thick atmosphere. In fact, Venus has about the same amount of nitrogen in its atmosphere as we do on the Earth. But its CO2 has gone into runaway. It has a humongous amount of CO2, which we think was released from the rocks. And this CO2 has built up an atmosphere which is over 90 times the pressure at the surface than what we're experiencing here on Earth. So there's a huge amount of material in there. And the temperature and the chemistry of that has caused this massive formation of a sulfuric acid haze around the planet. And that's what we're seeing here, the different densities of those cloud structures in the atmosphere of Venus. And it has this supersonic jet. You can see there's no real kind of latitudinal structure here. It's just this massive jet going all the way around the planet. And if we can look in different wavelengths, we can get a different picture of that. We can understand more about those structures. And so now we're looking in the infrared and we can start to see that we're getting blocked by larger material, these dark patches, and we're seeing through to these brighter patches in the middle. Now move on to an atmosphere which isn't particularly thick at all, but can be very, very dramatic. And that's Mars's atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere is very, very thin. In fact, it's so thin that a hurricane on Mars, the wind speed of a hurricane would not have anywhere near the force of a hurricane. In fact, you could quite easily just happily walk through it and you wouldn't even be able to fly a kite. So that's how thin the atmosphere is. If you've got a hurricane speed winds, the force is negligible. So what you're seeing here is these teeny tiny dust rust particles on the surface that give it its characteristic red colour. 
being lifted into the atmosphere by those hurricane speed winds and being whipped around the planet all over. So we can see that it's been completely masked in just a few months. And this is a global dust storm. And it happens when Mars gets at its closest approach to the sun. So we've got a big change in what the planet looks like there. Uh, moving on to my niece's favourite planet. It's her favourite planet, and I'm thinking it's because we've got these insane images of this world. You can see through your telescopes the structure of the atmosphere of this world. It is beautifully banded. It is Jupiter. And this is an image from Juno of that great red spot, that hurricane that is three times the size of the Earth. And if we look at some of these new beautiful images of the poles of Jupiter, something we can't see from our vantage point, we're looking at our solar system edge on. We're like a plate and we're looking along the plate. So we're seeing Jupiter and its bands around its equator. But things that we can send to them, so these, these satellites that we can send to other planets in our solar system have revealed that the poles of the planets are the most interesting places. And Jupiter is 11 times the size of the Earth, 11 times the radius in terms of its size and 315 times its mass. So you've got 315 Earths in there. And you can see some of these swirling vortexes at the pole of Jupiter, which are about the size of the Earth. And these are looking deep down into the atmosphere. So we're learning more about the circulation of that atmosphere and how that turbulence you see from that really fast rotation affects the pole. If we move on to Saturn, we see something different happening at the pole. We see this massive hexagonal structure forming. You can see this beautiful and very natural structure formed by the rotation and these waves in the atmosphere and at its center this huge huge kind of hurricane which is going deep down into the atmosphere this we're looking at here is an edge it really is like a 3d structure we're looking at where this is going down thousands of kilometers and this is about twice the size of the Earth, just across the pole of Saturn. So it's this massive structure, which is still actually smaller than the Great Red Spot at its largest extent. But it is this beautiful hexagonal shape that you're seeing. And then finally, one of my favourite things in the solar system, the winds of Neptune. It sounds like a title to a sci-fi book, but Neptune is this beautiful world right on the edge of our solar system it receives very little sunlight and yet its winds are the fastest in our solar system they go up to 1300 miles per hour so this is an incredibly strong winds around this world and the questions we have about neptune and uranus is where do they get their energy from there's huge amounts of energy imbalance in these planets and we just don't understand them yet. So the next step in our solar system is really sending something out to these ice giants and trying to understand what are they like and how, how is everything happening out there where there is so little sunlight, so little energy put in from that star, yet so much dynamic processes. So we have a huge amount to learn from our solar system and still a huge amount to learn about our solar system. We're not there yet. We don't understand all the planets in the gory details. We don't understand the energy budget, the magnetic fields of these ice giants. So we need to understand that to really push our limits on what we can use to understand other planets. So I'm going to take us now out to the stars and I'm certain that some of the pictures we're going to see later today are better than this blurry one I've got in the background. But we're going to travel out to the stars and ask the question, what planets are out there? How can we look for them? And what can we learn about the nature of these planets' atmospheres? And that journey actually starts in 450 BC with Epicurus, who believed that the universe was infinite and that the number of atoms were infinite. 
and stated that therefore there must be an infinite number of worlds out there, both like and unlike our own. So the Epicurean philosophy said that there had to be other planets out there. Why wouldn't there be? There'll be some that are like our planet and there'll be some that aren't like our planet. And that journey of trying to understand what those planets were like would take many thousands of years. So we're going to jump forward to the 1600s in Europe. And it's actually Christian Huygens, the probe that landed on Titan, the moon of Saturn, was named after him, who postulated that the way that we observe the moons of Jupiter orbiting around that planet, blocking out, causing shadows, the way that we make those observations, we could do the same thing for stars. If we look at a star, we should be able to see the planets shining around that star. We should be able to see them pass in front of that star. And we should be able to see the change in the system based on just observing that star. Now, this was way too early to have that kind of idea, way, way too early. Back in the 1600s, we had no idea how far away the stars were. Absolutely none. We didn't know that they were, you know, at minimum four light years away, all the way out to the edge of the observable universe. We didn't know how many stars there were in the Milky Way, how many stars there were across the sky. And we had no idea exactly where they were. So it's an amazing idea that we've actually put into action. But it was impossible back then to understand just how small the numbers are that you would need to be able to measure to get that image. And then finally, we jump to the 1800s, 1855, to be precise. And this is the first false scientific claim of an exoplanet. So there was a W.S. Jacob from the East India Trading Company was running the observatory at Madras in India and uh, observed the star 70 Ophir Yukai and stated in a paper that was written to the Royal Astronomical Society that there was a planet orbiting around the star and that they knew that because the star itself had moved. And by measuring its motion, they were able to infer that there must be something invisible orbiting it. Now, this is not true. Uh, 70 Ophiuchi is actually a binary star system. So what they were measuring is an invisible binary, which is in that kind of bright spot there. So it's even kind of obscured. You're seeing two stars here instead of one. But that idea of planets being in the scientific literature has been around now for over 150 years. But it's only in the last 20 25 years that actually that has become a reality. The first exoplanet was discovered and confirmed in 1995, orbiting a sun-like star. And since then, we've seen a huge number of planets that have been discovered. This is even old. This is in 2018. It's now 2021 and there are thousands more. We are discovering more and more planets every single week. And it is a truly amazing thing that we're seeing an understanding of these worlds and what we're looking for. What you're seeing in the colors here are the different methods that have been used to discover these worlds. And I'll take us through just one of these methods, the transit method. And that's because you can see it creates this big cluster here and here. These planets are actually really, really useful to delve in and find more information. But what are we looking at here? What, what, how can, what is this showing us? It's showing us the separation of these planets from their star. So how close do they orbit their star? And it's showing us their mass. But we really need to put the solar system planets on here to put that in context. So if we put our solar system on here, we've got our Earth at one astronomical unit. We've got Jupiter at our one Jupiter mass. And you can see our solar system worlds there. And that very few, if none of these, actually sit at the same orbital distance with the same mass as our solar system worlds. 
we have this big, big group, this big hole here and this big group here. This is telling us that we've got things that are roughly the same size as some of our planets, but much, much closer to their star. So I want you to kind of put this in context. I'm going to give you a visual to try and understand the sizes of our planets in the solar system and some of these worlds that we're looking at up here. And that is to imagine that the Earth is the size of a pea. On this scale, Neptune and Uranus would be about the size of a plum. Our Jupiter, 11 times the radius of the Earth, would be about an orange. But some of these worlds here, you're seeing, they're more massive, but they're also bigger in their radius. Some of these worlds here are being heated by their star so much, and they're so hot interior that they are blown up to much, much bigger sizes. And they would be our watermelons of the galaxy. So we have this fruit basket of planets left to explore and understand and ask how similar are they to our solar system? And actually, when we think about and we're able to do measurements of their atmosphere, we don't have these thousands of worlds. We actually only have a couple of hundred worlds where we can investigate their atmosphere. And that's because they're orbiting a bright star. They are transiting their star. So they pass in front of their star relative to our point of view. We can get the masses of them because they're orbiting quite close and they're quite massive. So there's a handful, there's a fraction of these thousands we're discovering that we can investigate more. And if we look at that fraction of them, we can put them on this diagram. You can see we've got a big cluster up here. These are our Jupiter-sized worlds very close to their star. Those are called hot Jupiters because they're so close to their star, they're very, very hot. They're thousands of degrees. So we're seeing these hot Jupiters cluster. They're very easy for us to measure their atmospheres and understand them. And then we've got this small scattering of planets across that mass range. But the nice thing, and this is one of my favorite things to do, is to take that information and then go, okay, well, let's see their mass and their radius and then compare it to our solar system. And suddenly we see our planets are very familiar once again. But these planets that we're looking at have just been put into different environments. They've been put closer to their stars. They're orbiting around different kinds of stars. So the big question is how does that affect its atmosphere? If we have something that is the same size as Jupiter, the same mass, the same radius, but much closer to its star, we can then imagine by looking at that planet, what would happen if Jupiter had careered through the solar system early in our formation and landed at an orbital distance 20 times closer than we are to the sun and became a hot Jupiter? What would happen to Jupiter's atmosphere? What would that planet look like? And we've got hundreds of worlds in here, about 300 worlds, and that number is increasing to investigate and ask those questions. What happens to our planets when we put them in different environments? So I'm going to be talking to you in specifically about a transiting planet. And the reason I'm going to talk to you about that is because the nature of the transit, the point where it passes in front of its star, or when it eclipsed by its star, the secondary eclipse here, where it passes behind its star, the nature of that event allows us to investigate that planet's atmosphere. Because we can see the light from the star get a continuous spectrum of that star. We can also see the light shining through that planet's atmosphere before it reaches our telescopes and get an absorption spectrum of that planet's atmosphere. And from that, from these dark lines, we can build up a picture of what is in that atmosphere, what that atmosphere is made of. So another way to look at this is if we look over here at this diagram, we're going to be looking at that planet transiting across its star. And what we actually are measuring is the change in the amount of light, which is just a ratio of the size of that planet relative to the size of that star squared. So we need to know the size of our star and we can work out the size of our planet. But if we do this across lots of different wavelengths and we build up this picture over different colors, 
we can start to measure the change in that depth. And what that's actually telling us is what's in that planet's atmosphere. We can see that in the red, it's actually absorbing more. That means something is in the atmosphere blocking more light. And from this, we can fit models to that to find out this planet has potassium in its atmosphere. One way to look at that in a slightly different way is the transit depth is measuring the apparent size of the planet. So if something's in the atmosphere blocking that light, then that planet will appear bigger. So if we look at the video over here, you'll see that the size of that planet gets bigger as there's something in the atmosphere blocking that light. The planet appears to be bigger because that atmosphere is absorbing that light, blocking it. So we can see the change in the size of the planet with wavelength. So if we build up that spectrum, we can get an idea of what the atmosphere is made of. And it's really important to look over lots of different wavelengths because different atoms and molecules actually absorb light in different ways. They each have a unique fingerprint and we can look for those fingerprints in the spectrum of that star as the planet is passing in front of it. And we can look for those fingerprints at different wavelengths because they absorb in different wavelengths. So water, for example, will absorb more in the infrared. CO2 absorbs at about four and a half microns. So much, much further beyond what our eyes can see. And that's what's actually in our atmosphere, the CO2, this water, they're in the Earth's atmosphere and they are very effective greenhouse gases. Because they absorb light in the infrared, it means that they're absorbing heat. And CO2 is a very effective absorber of heat. So that is what is contributing to the warming of our planet. And you can see different layers of the atmosphere with different wavelengths. But one thing that we want to know is we don't just want to look at these giant Jupiter-sized worlds. Can we look at smaller planets? Can we look at things the size of Neptune or even things the size of the Earth? And while this is something that we definitely can do and we have done, it's actually much, much harder to look at these smaller worlds. And that's because the signatures in their atmosphere are not as big. So if you've got a Jupiter atmosphere, it's big, it's extended, it goes down many, many hundreds of kilometers. That means we've got a lot of area for our light to shine through before it reaches our telescope. Whereas for the Earth, we have an incredibly thin atmosphere. And that tiny amount of area that that light shines through before it reaches our telescopes, the tiny amount of area where you have something that's absorbing that light makes it much, much harder for us to make those measurements. So when we're looking at smaller planets, we're actually looking at smaller stars because this is a relative measurement. It means that the smaller the star, the smaller the planet that you can look at. So there's a huge amount of tip, like tricks that we're doing to try and understand planets across the spectrum of sizes. And we've actually been really, really successful at that. So we're seeing again here planetary mass, so the mass of our planets and the radius of our planets. And I'm just going to show you a huge range of spectra that we have taken of those planets' atmospheres across that phase space. You can see we've got a whole load of Jupiters up here, measurements that we're making of those atmospheres, trying to understand them. These are planets in other star systems, sometimes a thousand parsecs away, and we're able to measure the atmosphere of that planet. It's pretty amazing. Down here, you can see some smaller worlds that we've looked at. This is the TRAPPIST-1 planetary system, seven Earth-sized worlds orbiting one very, very tiny, very, very cold star. So the star itself is just 10% the size of the sun, and it is only 2,500 Kelvin. That's incredibly cold for a star. And these worlds we're able to measure, again, because that star is smaller, we can measure smaller planets. And from this, from the observations we've made with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've actually been able to rule out that they have giant helium atmospheres around them. They're not primordial. When the Earth started, we would have had a nice helium envelope around us, a nice blanket around us. But 
as time went on, we couldn't hold on to that. We didn't have enough gravity. So that helium escaped and that hydrogen escaped. And we've been able to show that these planets likely have evolved past that state as well. So these are mature planets around this star. But you can see just such a beautiful array of worlds across there that we've looked at. And one of the best studies that we've done of these planetary atmospheres is actually looking at 10 of these worlds. And these 10 worlds, you can see in this artist depiction spinning away here, these 10 worlds are all relatively similar to each other. They're all about the size of Jupiter. They're all about the mass of Jupiter. They just happen to orbit their stars much, much closer than we are to the sun. They also orbit different kinds of stars, but not different enough to explain why there's such differences in their atmospheres. When we look at these 10 worlds, what we're seeing from the top here down to these worlds at the bottom is we're seeing huge differences in the dynamics and chemistry of their atmospheres, even though they're all pretty much the same size. What you can see here is absorption features. So this means that in the atmosphere, there is the presence of these materials, which is blocking the light. We're seeing sodium. Sometimes we're seeing potassium features. We're seeing water absorption. So this is water in its gas phase. So this is vapor in the atmosphere of these worlds. These are Jupiter sized worlds. They don't have a surface that you can imagine. They are atmosphere all the way down, hydrogen and helium gas giants sitting right next to the furnace of their star. In fact, they're so close to their star, they're what we call tidally locked. This is the same thing that we see for the moon. There is a permanent face looking at the star and a permanent face looking out into space. So these are on very tight orbits around their star. The shortest one is just 20 hours. So they're very different from what we can imagine for something like Jupiter, which is rotating every 10 hours and orbiting every 12 years. This is what happens when you put Jupiter under the furnace of its star. And you see this variation that we found across these Jupiters from clear atmospheres where we can see these absorption features from the gases in the atmosphere, water here in these top ones, down through kind of flat lines. We're not seeing any features at all here to these very scattering. This is showing you that we're scattering away all of that blue light and we're seeing all this red light. This is scattering, which is much, much greater than anything we have in our atmosphere that causes our sky to be blue. So our sky is blue because we see scattering by the nitrogen particles in the atmosphere. It scatters away that blue light. And you'd see a spectrum that looks very much like this. But this is much, much steeper than that. This is about four or five times steeper, which suggests there's something in the atmosphere scattering that light. So tiny, tiny things in the atmosphere scattering the light. And we wanted to investigate this kind of continuum from these clearer to these cloudy worlds. So what we did is we started to look across even more planets. We looked at about 50 different planets and we're looking to see this particular water absorption feature. So this is the spectrum of a whole range of planets that we've looked at with the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the absorption of water vapor in their atmospheres. And what we found was that we can detect the presence of water vapor in the atmospheres of these exoplanets, sometimes hundreds of light years away, in 80% of the planets that we look at. Water vapor is one of the most common molecules in the entire universe. It's out there and it's gonna form and it likes to form and it's very, very stable when it does. So we weren't surprised that we found water. We were looking for it. What we were surprised at was that actually those absorption features didn't look like what we thought they would. We thought they'd look like this blue band here, big, bold, sharp edge to a drop off. 
But what we measured was something more like the purple line. Still a distinct difference from a flat line, but not the big, bold water absorption features that we thought. And what we found is actually that the median amplitude was 33, a third of what we expect it to be. So what is causing that? And this is one of the most fascinating things that I find in exoplanet atmospheres. If we take a spectrum of an atmosphere, this is what we expect to measure for a giant hydrogen helium dominated world close to its star, about 1,500 degrees. This is what we would expect to measure for it. And we'll be making those measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope right now. And the Hubble Space Telescope has multiple instruments on it that can allow us access to different parts of that spectrum. And we're gonna focus on this one here. This is the Wide Field Camera 3 instrument, the third installation of their Wide Field instrument. And it, got, it has bands that look in the infrared beautifully over where this water absorption feature should be. But if we put different things in the atmosphere, we start to see different effects. If we put clouds in that atmosphere, droplets, liquid or solid suspended in a gas, that is a cloud. If we put a cloud in the atmosphere where the particles are large, so big droplets in the atmosphere, you end up actually having a spectrum that looks more like this. If you put clouds in the atmosphere that are very, very tiny particles, more like the ice crystals you see in the noctilucent clouds, you get a spectrum that looks like this. We start to see those patterns that we just saw across all those planets that we looked at. This scattering, this flatness, all these beautiful absorption features. And if we zoom in to this region where we're looking with that infrared camera on Hubble, across all of those planets that we looked at, nearly 50 worlds that we were able to examine, you can see that the difference between our 100% amplitude, so what we expect to see, and what the clouds might affect it, is somewhere in that 33 plus or minus 24%. So clouds in the atmosphere are the thing that is responsible for changing what the spectrum looks like when we measure it. So let's now explore some of these alien worlds and see what their clouds are doing to their atmosphere. So I'm gonna take you on a sunset journey now. We're gonna look at what a simulation of a sunset would look like. And this is imagining that we're in a very well protected spaceship in the atmosphere of this planet, looking out towards the star. So we're looking through the atmosphere towards the star. Imagine those images that you see from the International Space Station, looking at the atmosphere of the Earth as the sun is rising behind it. You see all those beautiful layers of the atmosphere. So our first simulation is truly alien. And this is to show that a very small change can make a very big difference. Our sunset is a beautiful teal green. What you're seeing here is a simulation of the sunset of a planet called HD 209458b. Long phone number name. That's the name of the star. The B, the lowercase b on the end is the, the planet itself. And this is caused by just one simple thing in the atmosphere. Sodium. If you put sodium in this planetary atmosphere and we don't have any other absorbers in the optical, that sodium is going to block all of the orange light. And when we block all of the orange light from our star, we end up with this beautiful green-blue sunset. But let's go to something a little bit more familiar. I've already talked a little bit about this. The scattering effect. And we see the effect of scattering right here on Earth in this beautiful red sunsets. That's what we see at sunset and sunrise. 
the light shining through these Earth's atmosphere makes the sun appear red. And that's because our atmosphere is scattering away all that blue light. This is a simulation of one of our hot Jupiters, HD 189733b. Now, HD 189 is incredibly close to its star. This is a simulation which is showing you not the stages of a sunset, but what you would see all at once. In our sunset, you'd see the colours of the sun change as it sets. What you would see for this world is the star would be the entire array of colours all the way across. Because you're so close to the star, it would be huge in the sky. In fact, we can compare it directly to what the Earth would look like. So this is the sun from the Earth relative scale to the sun from the atmosphere of HD 189733b. We're so close to the star there, we're seeing all of the colours across that. And this scattering is due to this big, big amount of haze in the atmosphere, this small particles scattering the light away. Now I'm going to focus in on this planet a little bit because this one's really fascinating. We've been able to study it in a lot of detail. And what we've been able to discover is that these clouds are made of sand, glass, magnesium silicates, forstrite, enstatite, the things you find on your beaches in the atmosphere of this planet, molten at over a thousand degrees. And that with measurements in the optical of this planet's light that is being reflected back to us, we've actually been able to tell the colour of this world. This is a simulation from the University of Exeter of HD 189's colour. That blue is a simulation based on measurements that we made of the reflected light from that planet's atmosphere. But it gets even more interesting. HD 189 is orbiting around a very violent star. And we've actually made measurements, again, this is a simulation, of this star flaring in the X-ray. So measurements of X-ray flares coming from the star. You see one going off there. And then we made measurements of the atmosphere being blown off from the planet. Hydrogen escaping from that planet's atmosphere in a comet-like tail due to the blasting of solar radiation. So not only does this have a beautiful Earth-like sunset, but it is absolutely nothing like the Earth at exactly the same time. That sunset caused by the scattering of light by glass crystals in the atmosphere. Hurtling around this world at over 5,000 miles per hour. I told you the winds on Neptune were 1,300 miles per hour, the fastest in our solar system. The winds on this world flying shards of glass at you the entire time you're watching that beautiful sunset at 5,000 miles per hour. But that's not the end of our exotic journey. We go on to one of my favorite worlds next. This one is a film noir sunset. Beautiful grayscale, little hints of green on the edge of your vision. This is WASP-12b. WASP-12b has one of the most boring spectrum that you can see. It is this beautiful scattered flat line. But there's a number of things that we know about WASP-12b. We know its temperature. We know its orbital period, so we can work out some of its dynamics. And we know its spectrum. So from that, what we've been able to determine is that this planet's atmosphere likely has clouds in it that are quite large. Now, when I say quite large, they're still smaller and thinner than a strand of hair, but that's quite large on, on cloud scales, that are scattering the light in this atmosphere. And because of its temperature, because this planet is so hot, there's only one material that can form clouds at that temperature. And that material is something called corundum which makes up rubies and sapphires here on the Earth. So the atmosphere of this film noir planet has rubies and sapphires floating around in it as its clouds, obscuring the light. 
And we can look at some of the studies across the temperature range. So temperature is hugely important for these clouds. Temperature really controls what is happening, what clouds are forming. And if you look at the temperatures here, we're talking incredibly hot. 700 is all the way down to kind of Venus surface temperature. The atmosphere of Venus is much, much colder than that. So we're not even hitting solar system temperatures here. These are very hot planets going all the way up to over 2,200 degrees. Some stars are this hot on the yellow end. <clears throat> But the atmospheres have these different clouds made of things quite literally salt, table salt. NaCl forms clouds in these atmospheres. We've got sulfur bearing species, sticky yellow species forming clouds. We then have our silicates, our magnesium silicates, our sand, our glass. And then we come to the gems and the jewels, our aluminium oxides in the atmosphere. These aluminium oxides only form at these highest temperatures. And as you go to cooler temperatures, they form deeper and deeper in the atmosphere where it's hotter and hotter. And then suddenly these silicates actually dominate the spectrum. So we've got this huge array of information we can get from just a spectrum of a planet, understanding its environment. What's its star like? Is it star blasting it with radiation? What effect is that gonna have? What's the temperature of this world? Is it a giant hydrogen helium dominated world? And from that spectrum, we can see the absorption features of different materials and we can start to understand how does that all come together to make an atmosphere? So if we go back to our diagram, you can see that we've been looking in these shorter wavelengths with the Hubble Space Telescope. There's this big difference between the different types of clouds that you would get and how they would affect your spectrum. But in the next month, we're going to launch the James Webb Space Telescope. December 18th, that's launching, touch wood. And that is going to open up a whole new range of wavelengths where we can start to measure the carbon based species in the atmosphere, not just the water, but the CO, the CO2 in the atmosphere. And we can look at the data from both the James Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope together to give us a big picture of what this planet is like. And one of the most interesting things to me is that actually these materials, these clouds, have their own absorption features. They don't just block the light in different ways, they absorb it as well. And these features are the things that I'm really interested in measuring. This is showing you what magnesium silicate, that glass, what the absorption signature of that glass is in the atmosphere. So we should be able to measure with the James Webb Space Telescope definitively, what are these clouds made of? How does that affect everything that we know about this atmosphere. And it's only when combining information from the Hubble Space Telescope, knowing that these clouds exist, they're scattering the light in a characteristic way, that we can go after it with the James Webb Space Telescope to try and understand what are those clouds made of. We have a good theoretical idea, now let's prove it. And I'm excited that we've got a huge range of planets to look at. And that number is ever increasing. There's so many different worlds out there. And we've learned so much by looking at all of these worlds. We've measured water absorption in loads of planetary atmospheres. We've seen scattering effects, sometimes hugely scattering. This one's actually overlapping. This is the spectrum down here with the planet above it, which kind of cuts across nicely. We've seen uniform. So this is saying that you're blocking light at all different wavelengths, suggesting there's large particles in the atmosphere. And we've seen some planets where we're trying to understand if they have an atmosphere at all. And what this all comes down to is trying to understand that Venn diagram of worlds out there from our stars, which again have these atmospheres. We're living inside our star's atmosphere to these brown dwarfs, these not quite stars, not quite planets. These are things that are over 13 times the mass of Jupiter, but they didn't get heavy enough to ignite at their cores and, and shine. And then we've got our planetary atmospheres. How does this continuum 
go all the way up because fundamentally the physics and chemistry of an atmosphere should be the same. What affects them and how? How can we better understand that? So we're looking across all of these beautiful worlds, trying to understand what they're like. What is this world other than something that's close in size to Jupiter, kind of the same mass, but what is it actually like? If you want to know more about exoplanets, then uh, I run a podcast called Exocast with my colleagues, Hugh Osborne, who is a, a detection specialist. So he discovers exoplanets. I do the classification, the characterization, understanding their atmospheres. And Andrew Rushby, who's our astrobiologist, is trying to understand about habitability in our universe. That podcast has now been running for a number of years now. And if you join us on Twitter, you'll see we're currently having a big competition to determine what the best exoplanet of 2021 is. I also have a book out, which I wrote with Professor Chris Lintott and Brian May. You can see proof there on the back. This is an update to their 2006 book, Bang. You can see the double exclamation point there saying that it's a new book. Um, and this now contains the last 15 years of discovery and all about exoplanets, the things that we've learned about our universe in the last 15 years, completely updated. So see if you can get a hold of that at some point. But from that, I'm going to say thank you so much for listening. And I'm really excited to answer your questions. I hope that you enjoyed our journey through those exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. That was an amazing talk. And um, I would, will have to give virtual applause. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, we've had a number of questions in the chat. The first one was from Amit Campbell. And I think he's referring to the diagram that showed um, a number of planets rotating next to a, a table, a list of yep. spectra. And um, he's saying, why is the first one's dark side red? I think he means that you can actually see colour on the dark side. And he's asking, was that because of the presence of another star or is it just because of the way the diagram is, is, is just an illustration, I guess, the question? Yeah, so th this is just an illustration. There's a number of things that now we know more about these worlds I would definitely update. But one of the things that that, that star, that one planet at the beginning being red, what that's trying to show you is that planet is actually really, really hot. Its internal heat, its own heat is heating up that planet's atmosphere. So even when you're looking at the night side, the dark side of this planet, you can still see it glowing. And that's because it's so hot, it's actually emitting light as well as blocking it. Okay, thanks for that, Hannah. Another question from John Drummond, which he said had been answered, but I'd like to expand on that a little bit. Um, it was to do with the hot Jupiters losing their atmospheres yeah. So presumably, even though they're really massive planets, being so close to a large star, they um, m most of them will generally be losing atmosphere to space, I guess. Yeah, so one of the things that we're trying to understand is, is how much these lose their atmospheres. And actually, we found that quite a lot of them don't seem to. If you're around an active star, that's going to give you that extra kick. So what we're seeing here is just genes escape. The, the atoms are given enough energy by the star for them to thermally escape from the planet's atmosphere. So we're losing the hydrogen here. For some smaller worlds, for some of our Neptunes, we're actually seeing that they're losing their helium. Helium was actually discovered in the atmosphere of exoplanets for the first time just a few years ago. It sounds a bit odd, but helium doesn't really scatter light it doesn't have a very strong fingerprint so it's hard for us to measure it so the first measurement we made was actually of it escaping from this planet's atmosphere and if we look at our diagram of the separation of our planets from their star and their mass you can see this big chunk here that doesn't seem to be filled in this is called the neptune desert these are our neptune sized worlds that can't exist really so what we're seeing here is this is actually a real feature. 
These blobs are observational bias. This is just due to the ease of the methods that we're using. But this is a real feature. And this is because if you've got something this size so close to its star, it can't hold on to its atmosphere. So what you'd see happen is that its atmosphere would be blown away and you'd end up with being a much smaller world without that huge atmosphere. So this Neptune desert, as we call it, is due to that escaping atmosphere. We think that it exists simply because these giant planets got so close to their star that they lost their atmosphere, they lost their hydrogen and helium, it got blown off, and now they are much, much smaller worlds. Okay, thanks, Hannah. That's really interesting. Um, John has got another question. He said the blue planet seemed to have some spectra emission at 1,653 nanometers, which is a methane line similar to Uranus and Neptune. Um, is that generally the case? That it's easy to detect methane in these planets' atmospheres? So for these spectra, we should be able to detect methane in the Hubble wavelengths, but we actually haven't been able to yet because there's this transition from these hotter planets where you go from CO dominated, so carbon monoxide dominates at hotter temperatures. And then when you get cooler, methane dominates over the CO. So these carbon species are hugely important in our understanding of these planetary atmospheres. And what we found so far is actually we're seeing the evidence of CO a lot more than methane. This planet's about 1,400, 1,200 Kelvin. So it's still going to be dominated by CO over methane, given that temperature range. So we're still trying to understand this transition. And we think that it actually might be colder than theoretical models suggest, because we're not being able to measure this methane. We haven't definitively done so for these exoplanet atmospheres yet, that we think that that fundamental aspect of the chemistry that we understand, there's something different happening here. The internal heat perhaps is keeping them uh, carbon monoxide dominated over methane dominated or something. So what's going to be amazing is the James Webb Space Telescope is actually going to be able to give us those wavelengths in much, much more detail than what we can get with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we're going to be able to measure our COs. We get CO2 absorption in the infrared here as well. And methane absorption is dominated around here. So this water absorption peak would be morphed into a very, very different shape if there was methane in the atmosphere. So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to help answer that question. OK, thanks, Hannah. I've got another question from Phantasm NZ, whose real name is Steve, apparently. Um, he's asking if there are examples where direct imaging can work together with the transit method to learn even more or validate what we've learned about exoplanet atmospheres. That's a fantastic question um, and one I've had discussions with direct imaging astronomers many, many times. And right now, those two methods don't overlap in the kind of types of planets they look at. The transit method is very much planets closer to their star, especially the ones where we can look at their atmospheres. That requires a good amount of light to be going through the atmosphere. So the angles, the geometry matters there. And the direct imaging ones, you need to block out all of the light from the star. And generally, we're about Saturn's distance, um, even further Neptune distance in terms of being able to measure these directly imaged worlds. So those two techniques don't currently overlap in their orbital periods of the planets that they can measure. But the direct imaging Jupiter's size giants that have been measured, they've measured their atmospheres and seen big differences between what we're measuring for these giant hot Jupiters. So we do see that there is this big difference. And if we go to that, you know, if we look at that Venn diagram, the directly imaged planets are kind of on the edge between these planetary atmospheres and these brown dwarfs. They kind of sit in that line there. So what we might see is those directly imaged ones that are really far out from their star are more on that continuum towards the brown dwarf atmospheres than these Jupiters, these hot Jupiters in the planetary atmospheres. And in the future, we will be pushing further and further with both techniques to look at things closer and closer to their star as our techniques for direct imaging get better. And we can get images of things like our solar system where you've got a Jupiter and a Saturn. We should be able to measure those. And we can start seeing uh, better and better for these transiting planets. So the more light we can collect, the bigger our, our space bucket 
the, the more light we can collect, the better we can get these measurements. So hopefully in the future, we'll have an overlap of those two methods. OK, thank you, Hannah. Um, Peter Newton asks, what are the most promising Earth-like rocky planets at the moment? I guess he means that are rocky planets that are similar mass and atmosphere to the Earth. And is the James Webb going to prioritise those type of planets? So the James Webb Space Telescope is a international telescope which anyone can apply for. You guys can apply for time to use the James Webb Space Telescope as you can with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's an open astronomy instrument. So the prioritization of time is dependent on the community. So if scientists proposed to focus on these things and they got selected by a group of their peers, then that would be the priority of that time. But what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to do is actually it's already scheduled to look at some of these worlds. So these TRAPPIST-1 planetary uh, system here, down here where we've, we've shown with the Hubble Space Telescope, they don't have a hydrogen envelope around them. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be going to look at three of these different worlds. So it's going to be looking at E, uh, B, I think, and D. So it's going to be looking at these different planets and trying to understand their spectrum in more detail. So you can see the uncertainties here. You can see the scatter. The Hubble's, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be very precise. It's going to be able to tell us, do these planets have atmospheres? And the TRAPPIST-1 system is very, very useful for us because there's seven planets around one star. We can remove the star from the equation. So we can ask OK, well, they're all around the one star. The star is not the thing changing here. That's our constants. So we've got these little test tubes of planets trying to see if they've got atmospheres, if their distance has the priority or if there's different factors in their environment that affects what kind of atmosphere they have. So this is going to be like a gold mine for information on that aspect. And these are only about 40 light years away. They're all likely to be rocky in some way. But these are kind of a, a priority right now of trying to understand these worlds. But in the future, I expect that to change in many, many different ways. OK, thanks, Hang on. I've got a question of my own. These um, hot Jupiters with clouds formed from things like silicates and um, illuminates, uh, is it possible that you can actually get a cycle of effectively rain falling where you get condensation of these materials, they fall down and, and re-vaporise um, lower down in the atmosphere and then re-solidify. Re so you could have rain of um, silicates or um, rubies or that kind of thing. It was just Yeah, that's like a fantastic... That's a fantastic observation, and that is exactly what we think is happening in, in parts of these atmospheres. In fact, we have measurements which suggest that as you go from that tidally locked permanent day side to this permanent night side, the temperature difference is huge. The temperature difference from being under your star, bright, nice heat to the night side where it's very, very cold can be very, very big. It can be a couple of hundred degrees. So if you change your temperature by a couple of hundred degrees, you change that condensation. You're kind of hitting this wall. And some observations have actually suggested that there's this cliff of clouds forming over the edge of that terminator from day to night side. And what we're seeing from these kinds of measurements and from simulations of these atmospheres is that we expect them to recycle exactly how you said, raining down through the atmosphere, growing in size, dropping through the atmosphere, and then being heated up. So then they never hit a surface. They don't like rain here on Earth, hit a surface and that's it. They form puddles. These go deeper in the atmosphere where it gets hotter and hotter, get re-vaporized and then travel being transported up to the top of the atmosphere where they condense again and go through this. So we do expect this recycling of material. And these condensates, these silicates, these corundums, they allow that process to happen. However, you see these hazes here, this big orange blob. These, these hazes actually are different. Those are photochemically generated materials. These are like soot um, or smog that you see. 
And those actually don't get destroyed in the same way. So if you heated them up, they wouldn't get destroyed. So when you produce a photochemically generated haze, that's permanent and that's there forever. So these condensates are a really nice recycling material, which forms droplets and solids and then it rains down and it goes into a vapor again and then it recycles in the atmosphere. So they're a really nice way of looking at the dynamics of these planets. Okay, thanks. That's really interesting. We better... Um... Um, oh, actually, just on that same subject, Otto was asking, is, there, is it possible to have atmospheres raining diamonds? <laughs> so, unfortunately, diamonds are a very different species. They don't really form very naturally, whereas these condensates will naturally kind of come together. They, they like to come together. It's very energy efficient, especially for the silicates. So the glass, the, the sand, it's very energy efficient to create a magnesium silica. We see it in all of these beautiful nebulae that you're going to, you've got pictures of. Um, so those are happy to form, whereas diamonds aren't particularly happy to form. You have to really, really force it. So unfortunately, I doubt that we'll be seeing raining diamonds in these. Okay, thanks. And I better make this the last question from Jenny McCormick. Um, she's basically asking of the planets you have researched, which have you found to be the most interesting and why? Or most exciting. I I love Wasp Twelve B that I showed you that film noir planet because it's got so many different angles that we needed to use to work out logically what might be happening, what might be forming those clouds in the atmosphere. It's so hot. Nothing should ever form a solid or a liquid. It should all be gas. It's just far too hot. So we had to kind of logic puzzle our way to working out what might be happening, come up with a prediction and test that. So I really love it when we're able to do that as scientists is just use our knowledge to try and put pieces together and then go, OK, well, what's next? So I really, really love that one. But another one which I think uh, the audience might find really interesting is something called HD 80606B. This is a Jupiter-sized planet on a comet, Halley's Comet-like orbit around its star. So it comes within just a fraction of an AU to its star, and then 111 days it goes on this cometry-like orbit, taking it out beyond Venus's orbit, and then back in towards its star. It's a Jupiter-sized world traveling around on this ridiculous ridiculous orbit around its star and what we've been able to measure is actually that when it when it does its passage close to its star the atmosphere heats up so much it's like being smacked with a rocket and we've been able to see the waves that have formed in that atmosphere been able to measure the temperature changes of that as it goes away from its star again and relaxes back to going okay we're good now and then it comes back to the fire again every 111 days so that one's a really fascinating cometry jupiter if you can imagine it i was going to um make that the last question but we've got <laughs> a quite an important one here from sonia she says um oh sorry it's not sonia it's spice x um, is it possible to detect signs of life through atmospheric spectroscopy? Yes, it is possible to detect signs of life through atmospheric spectroscopy. However, we don't currently have the technology to be able to do so. So the atmosphere does hold signatures of life on our planet. If you look at the Earth's atmosphere as if we were doing the same measurements that we've been doing for these giant planets, you can see very telltale signs of life on our planet. Something called the red edge is the indication of chlorophyll on plants. There's also uh, the O3, the ozone. And we've also got a very uh, distinctive imbalance between gases. So we've got more methane than we should have, which means something is constantly replenishing the methane. It shouldn't be there naturally in the amount that it is. So what we would do to determine if there's something in the spectrum for life is looking at the imbalance of molecules compared to what would naturally form the differences between that and something that is then causing it to be different. That can tell us if there's life on that planet. But we don't currently have the technology to be able to make those measurements. They're incredibly difficult to make. OK, so I think we'll, um, that's all the questions. So thanks very much, Hannah. We've had a lot of appreciative comments on the 
YouTube chat. So thank you very much. So we're going to move on to um, a new part of the uh, tonight's presentation where Andrew Buckingham is going to announce the results of the New Zealand astrophotography competition. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks again, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm, I'm pleased tonight to um, be able to announce the competition winners. Uh, so the 2021 competition received over 300 entries and the entries are divided into four categories, uh, deep sky, nightscape, uh, solar system and time lapse. Uh, this year's judge is Robert Jenler from the United States, an ex a very experienced astrophotographer who has published uh, four books, um, has a couple of stamps um, he produced, and um, amongst many accomplishments, they include being awarded the Hubble Prize for contribution to astrophotography. So as I go through the uh, Kaida Kimeter and winners, I will uh, read his comments out. So the first section tonight is the deep sky section. Uh, and the winner from the deep sky section receives uh, $200 in cash from the Auckland Astronomical Society, a uh, $500, voucher, $500 voucher from Celestron Australia, and a $100 voucher from Skylabs New Zealand, as well as a one year subscription to the Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Australian Sky and Telescope magazine will also be publishing um, the a number of the photos of the winners tonight in upcoming issues. So our first highly committed photo is from Chester uh, Hall Fernandez, the Arby Dragons. The judge's comment is, I appreciate creative planning and composition. And this image certainly has both, in addition to deep acquisition, uh, careful processing and control of the dynamic range. Our second highly committed photo is from Matthew Ludgate, uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud in Narrow Band. A terrific presentation of the myriad star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Composition, planning, acquisition and processing are all first rate. And the winner of the uh, deep sky section is Rolf Well Olsen uh, with the supernova 1987A light echoes. Judge says, this image stands out among the rest of the deep sky submissions for its creativity and overall presentation. It is an unusual deep sky image and that there's intriguing science embedded within the fine details and vibrant color of this masterly acquired and processed portrait, which includes this expanding shockwave of supernova 1987A. Congratulations, Rolf. So our section section we're gonna look at is the Nightscape Artistic section. The winner of the Nightscape Artistic section receives $200 cash prize from the Auckland Astronomical Society a $100 um, voucher from Skylabs New Zealand, and a one-year subscription to Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. So our first highly commended uh, entry is from uh, Frank Hopfler, Coupe S Sail by Moonset. This is another stunning composition with many fine features for the eye to feast. I particularly like the inclusion of the setting moon and the orange red hues contrasted against the blueness of the Milky Way, of the night sky, Milky Way and Magellanic clouds. One word, excellent. Our second highly committed entry is from Laren Ray, the Taranaki Milky Way. This one is special as well. The inclusion of the stargazer makes for a story within the composition. The pleasantly processed arching Milky Way, large and small Magellanic cloud against the snowy foreground uh, makes for a very pleasing image that also tells a story. And the winner of the Nightscape section is Lee Cook with Nightscape X. 
The visual impact of nightscape photography is weighted heavily by the composition, and this one is absolutely stunning. The snow-peaked mountains, river, and human presence in the valley vi village composing the foreground all serve to exquisitely frame the majestic form of our Milky Way. Flanked left by the Magellanic Clouds, I love this image. Congratulations, Lee, for winning that section. Our third section is the solar system section. Uh, the solar system section receives a $200 cash prize from the Auckland Astronomical Society, a $300 uh, voucher from Astrons, and a $100 voucher from Skylabs New Zealand. Our first highly committed um, entry in this section is from Charles Brooks, the lunar eclipse umbral phase. A fine creative composition. The inclusion of the background star field, carefully Im uh, imaged and layered into the composition, is a testament to excellent planning and creative thinking. Superb processing of the moon as well. Our second uh, highly commended is Greg Stevens, again with the lunar eclipse. The appeal of this composition is the particular choice of the arrangement of phases in relation to the featured eclipse moon and the expert control of dynamic range, an overall very appealing composition. And this, this year was the section seems to go with a theme because the winner of the solar system section is Chris Wade with full moon. What attracts me to this image is the subtlety, the masterly control of the dynamic range and subtle colors of the mineral moon create for me. They create for me an aliveness of lunar surface features, which is rare in lunar imaging. So congratulations, Chris, winning the solar system section. And our last section is the time lapse section. And we will show you the, the full lapses here. So the winner of the time lapse section receives a $200 cash prize from the Auckland Astronomical Society and a $100 voucher uh, from Skylabs New Zealand. Uh, our first time lapse, our first time lapse in the highly commended section is from Mark Murphy, the Aurora Cosray Dark. A wonderful capture of Aurora Australis, a treat for all those at Aurora and Friendly Latitudes. Our second highly committed entry is from Glenn Butler, Hukai Tan. The snow top peak and lake reflection of the rise of Magellanic clouds in Milky Way make for a stunning visual treat in this outstanding composition, superbly planned and executed. The third highly committed entry from Mikey McKibben, the Kerry Kerry Milky Way. Stunning composition and capture with excellent choice of eye catching feature uh, that directs the viewer's eye upward at the rising galaxy. And a fourth highly committed entry Stapo Nape from Paul Wilson. I liked all the submissions by this contributor. However, I love this particular piece for its transitions, especially the Milky Way juxtaposed to the trees at sunrise, fantastic.
And the winner of the uh, time lapse section is Stephen Patience with Milky Way with Aurora Australis. This time lapse was an extraordinary 13 hour collection of delightful phenomenon and transitions, including a gorgeous sunset as a prelude to a rising Milky Way and small Magellanic cloud and serendipitous appearance of the Aurora Australis. Just a pleasure to view over and over again. Congratulations, Stephen, on winning the night, uh, reading the time lapse section. So overall, so the uh, the winner of each of the sections is eligible for going in the overall winner as the Harry Williams Trophy. The winner of the Harry Williams Trophy uh, will receive a five hundred dollar um, Scotch or Australia voucher, as well as a three hundred dollar cash prize from the Auckland Astronomical Society. And the annual hold for the year, the coveted Harry Williams Trophy. So the big moment we're waiting for. This year's winner of the Harry Williams Trophy is a very well-deserved Rolf Wall Olsen with the Light Echoes in 1987A. So 1987A. This image uh, clearly um, stands out among the rest for its creativity, planning, and execution and overall presentation. It's such an unusual deep sky image capturing an intriguing astronomical phenom phenomenon skillfully embedded with the fine details and vibrant color of this masterly planned, acquired and processed portrait, featuring the expanding shockwave of Supernova 1987A, a masterpiece, which I think sums up, up well. So uh, congratulations, Rolf, on your on winning the section and being the overall winner of the Harry Williams Trophy. Also, a big thank you to all the sponsors of the competition. It's uh, Skywatcher Australia, Astrons, Australian Sky and Telescope Magazine, uh, uh, Skylabs New Zealand, and Celestron Australia. And of course, the Auckland Astronomical Society for running the competition. Uh, thank you to our judge and uh, his work put in. And a big thank you to Jonathan Green uh, for his tremendous work in organizing the competition we're running at the moment. Uh, if you want to view all the entries um, that were in this year's competition, the a video of the entries are now available on the Auckland National Society YouTube channel. Um, enjoy, enjoy your view of those and see if you agree with the judges. Otherwise, congratulations to everyone again, and we hope to see uh, your entries in the 2022 competition. I'll pass back to you, Bill. Thank you, Andrew. Um, some amazing images again this year, and I think um, Rolf from memory has won the deep sky section several times. I think it might be his first um, uh, overall win of the uh, Harry Williams Trophy, so congratulations to Rolf. And again, um, thank you for an awake sort of amazing uh, lecture, one of the memorable uh, Burbage lectures, I, th I feel. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll be back to our normal program next week. And hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to resume meetings at the start. So thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>